All right, line W1, learning task four, we're gonna take a look at AC soft start uh, starters. Um, AC soft starts, as we commonly call these things, are going to allow us to go and take a drive, take a uh, motor, and basically control that motor all the way from zero all the way up to my full speed. And they're not gonna give me anything extra. They're not gonna allow me to go and change speeds. It's just gonna give me a very soft acceleration that's gonna be leading into my full speed. Hence why they're gonna be called our soft start controllers. They're a solid state reduced voltage starter. Going back to what we covered when we were looking at uh, three phase we, and three phase motors, we went through the three phase squirrel and cage induction motors. Then we talked about how when we get these motors started out, we're gonna get a massive amount of inrush due to the fact that we've got our rotor that is gonna be at a standstill. We induce a lot of current to get that thing moving. Because we have all of that, we've got all of these reduced voltage methods of starting, which just are there to go and change the amount of inrush current that we are going to be seeing off of any one of these devices. Uh, what the soft start will do is it is going to do the exact same thing. It's just going to go and change the amount of current that we are going to go and have on our input and it's going to allow us to go and wrap that in. But instead of just having one or two stages, the way that like impedance starting has a couple of stages or Y delta has a couple of stages, this is going to go and give us a continuously variable one, which is really, really, really easy on equipment, drive chains, uh, belts, gearboxes, any sort of motive equipment that we have. <clears throat> Let's talk about the actual components that we are going to go and have. Uh, the VFD itself is going to be more or less this section that's going to be inside of here. Fusing can sometimes be inside of the VFD. That's going to come with integral fuses. Other times the fusing is going to be on the outside of the VFD. Uh, but the VFD itself is going to be composed of main current carrying controls, that's going to be these here back-to-back -back SCRs that I'm going to go and have, as well as a way for us to go and monitor what's going on. And really that's it for the main current carrying channels. They're ridiculously simple in the, uh, the main current carrying ones that we have. Where they get complicated is going to be inside of the control this section that we are going to go and have over here. And that's gonna be put together by a manufacturer. We're not gonna put that together ourselves. All we have to do is we have to go and run the lines into the actual controls. We're gonna have you know inputs that we need to have. They have reset, start and stop here that are shown as a demonstration. Uh, but we're just gonna wire those inputs in that are gonna go and give us when we want this motor to start. And then everything else is gonna be programmed inside of here. We're gonna go and program things like ramp times. How long do we want this thing to go and ramp up to speed? What do we want that duration of time to go and be? How long do we want this thing to go and ramp down when we're coming off of uh, speed, etc. Uh, that we're gonna program in there. We need to go and put in all of our parameters, the amount of current that this motor should be drawing, the amount of volts that this motor is gonna be rated for, all of that other stuff uh, that is gonna be off the nameplate, we will place inside of here, design class, you know, all of that is going to make a difference to the amount of inrush and what should be expected. All of it is programmed inside, you know, it follows all of our NEMA and I, uh, IEEE standards for motors. So when we program in that we've got a design class C, it automatically knows that we're looking at a you know double rotor that's going to have a higher initial starting torque than what we have for a running torque. And it has a general idea how that curve should look and it can respond based upon the horsepower that we program in and then the amount of current that we're putting through, it can respond accurately to what might be happening inside of that motor. We do also provide electronic overloads inside of here. You'll note that there's no actual overloads through here, but what I'm going to do is once again, programming in that information, I'm going to be monitoring through these CTs. And as I monitor through those CTs, if I go and hit you know, more than what the rated amount of current is gonna be, so I'm operating up here with too much current, uh, then it's going to be able to go and shut this thing down. You know, where is it just gonna close off and give us an error light that'll let us know we had that overload. We can also go and program inside of there, you know, length of time that we're going to allow an overload to be present before we have to go and change it or anything like that. In some cases, we will have some soft, uh, soft starters that are going to go and transition the soft start section itself offline. They're going to go to a contactor that is going to go and fire in once we actually get up to full power. And really all that that contactor would be doing is it would be bypassing around my SCRs that are going to be controlling the main current. They're showing us one over here. During startup, it would only be this that would be 
energized, so we would be able to pass current through each of our lines through our SCR. Uh, our SCRs are going to alternate, we'll cover that in a second, what it's going to look like, but it's going to go pass through to the motor once the motor gets all the way up to running speed, then what would happen is we would go and transition to this over here, which would be our run. And then once we've transitioned over to our run, we can open this one up over here and our current should stay going through like this. Now, what they're showing here, there's a number of errors inside of this uh, drawing is uh, the biggest one is just the location of this tag that they have. That tag should be going down right over here. It should not be going and bypassing the fusing, the overcurrent protection when we're in the run position. We should always have our fuses that are going to be inside of it. So just ignore that. The fact that they have that line over there, cross it outside of your books, you know, bring those ones all the way back down to here. And when you do that, you see that we've got this uh, closed transition that we can go to with them. This is really good because then we're not running current through these SCRs. We can shut off the triggering. In fact, we only need to go and run the semiconductor circuits that are going to be monitoring the, the CTs, the SCRs, all that other stuff. We would only need to be running that during our startup. For the rest, my CTs are just going to monitor the amount of current going out. And anytime that I would go into that overload, if I would go into an overload, once again, it was going to go and transition over in a closed state to shut this off. So it's going to go to the start. It's going to fire the start. Then it would open the run. And then it would go and ramp back on my SCRs over here, allowing me to go and shut that thing down. If I do have the integrated contactor with them, which some of these do have, uh, then I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful on my controls. Now, they are showing, and this is derived from uh, actual manufacturer's um, schematics over here, where this one has been pulled from. You're going to have to follow the manufacturer's their drawings when you're going to hook these up. In some cases, you have to go and apply what they have inside of here, which is three wire stop start, where they're actually wiring it, three wire stop start through here. In a lot of other cases, you do not need to go this fancy with it. The contactor itself is going to get fired just through control relays. Some of our other ones, really all that we have is we just take a single stinger down there, and from that single stinger, we're going to go and take off each of our individual buttons or switches or things like that. And common, common way that, you know, a lot of electronic drives have is we're going to still have a normally closed for our stop. So just let's, let's ignore everything that they have here and up here. And I'm just going to talk about terminal boards in general. In a lot of our drives, we're just going to have to go and run a stop into a single line. We're going to have to run a start push button into a single line. We don't need to put in, you know, ceiling contacts, anything like that. Sometimes we're going to go and have a switch that's going to go and be you know, for forward and reverse. It doesn't even need to be two positions because the digital logic inside there can say, hey, if that switch is open, therefore I don't have that signal, therefore I must be running in forward or, you know, the switch is closed, therefore I must be running in reverse. So it's a single input that allows us to go and do that. We sometimes have other, you know, inputs that are going to come off of it as well, where we might have um, like a normally open like this for a reset, you know, that we can go and reset after we go into a overload or anything like that. So this is a common control type where we just got a single hot stinger and then we're just taking a single tag off of every device back in. Expect to see a lot of that on a lot of drives. Occasionally you could run into something like this as well where they have everything run through the actual components. And if you follow it through, it does still follow in our regular control components. If you take a look, we got a fuse inside of here. This is power. So we're just going to put a plus there, and then this would be power. We're going to put a plus over there, even though it's AC. We're just going to call that, you know, the, the hotline. This side over here, you see that they've got a control transformer that has been grounded down. So we will just go and take the grounded down one. We'll take that one here. We'll take that one over here, and we'll just go and call that neutral and neutral. Two and three have got the same potential that we have over there. Really then, to trace out the rest of your control circuit, you should be able to see that this start over here, that I've got in line with this and this stop that I've got over here in line with this one are going to go and have power that is gets carried through my circuit. So looking at this one here, I see that when I press start over here, that start is going to go and provide power from here, up to here, up to here, right? So we can press start, we can go and provide power. We see that that power is being placed in parallel across from here to here. Is this correct? 
Absolutely not. You know, I hate to break it to you, but they screwed up their own set of drawings on here. That's why we're just going through it. Otherwise, normally I wouldn't, but I know otherwise some of you will twist yourself into circles later on trying to go and sort this thing out. Because what we see is that this thing as is, if we press our start, we would feed power up into here and then would have no place to go uh, because that contact over there would be sitting open. They have interchanged the start and the stop button. And this should be hopefully... Um, evident to you just off of the fact that the stop is always going to be in line and then the start is going to be downstream from that. So change that around inside of your own books, then you can follow it through. After that, if you follow it through, you would see that it's going to act the same as any other regular stop start uh, system. We'll make that normally close. We will make this normally open like that. And you would see from there, I've got this tied to a normally open over here. I've got my start up to there i press the start when i press the start it's going to provide power all the way through my k2 contactor which goes back to the neutral when k2 closes in what it will do is it's going to go and close in this set of contacts over here which is going to go and seal my circuit in small details once again not necessarily going to go and be a common control scenario that you're going to run into where you have to do the three wire control external to the machine. It's far, far, far more common that you are going to have to do just that single stinger with a single device coming off of each. It makes troubleshooting a heck of a lot easier as well because you don't have to worry about series contacts. You just have to fire each of those individual contacts in. Um, other thing I want to point out is that most drives, doesn't matter what the family is going to go and be, are going to go and have something like this. So we call this a dry contact. And dry contact means that it's not connected to any sort of power source unless I externally connect. That's what we're seeing over here is that they're connecting into that. Uh, this is just going to be a common that they're going to have. And then they've got a normally open and a normally closed. So if I've got normally open, normally closed over here, I can use them to fire anything else. Uh, I could run it off of this value of voltage. Yeah, I could even run it off of something different. If I wanted to run it off of a different power source, we'll scratch that line, I could feed in, you know, 230 volts onto this dry contact, run through a normally open, normally closed, use it for indicating lights or auxiliary contacts or anything like that. The benefits of having a contactor in here, having something in like this, is the fact that once I actually get into a run, I'm able to go and isolate that, I'm able to go and open that, and then I don't have to worry as much about my DV. DT. We've talked about this a number of times. Uh, DVDT is going to be that change of voltage over top of change in time, and we know that this is an issue for thigh wrister stuff that's going to be made with the thigh right as a base. SCRs, FETs, any of those type of components. A regular AC sine wave is good, but as soon as my AC sine wave has got junk off of it, rapid rises or rapid drops, little switching transients as we commonly call them, the steepness of those switching transients is enough that it can sometimes just shock the SCRs into conduction. It kind of just I don't know, startles them or whatever you want to call it, but it pushes them into conduction and then we could accidentally gate these things when we don't want them to be gated. So by having this and isolating these over here, now even if there is a little bit of you know junk on the system there, these things can be shocked a little bit, but they're not going to do anything because they're not actually passing the current through these things. Anytime that we are working with these, because of the presence of semiconductors, we are going to once again need to be very mindful of our heat, heat dissipation, and heat sinks. Do not go and block the heat sinks. Make sure that you are aware that heat sinks on the external of the machine are always going to be safe to touch. They're going to be grounded, but heat sinks that are inside of the machine could be connected live. In a lot of cases, they're going to be connected to the anode or the cathodes of our SCR, so don't touch them. They be operating at lethal values of voltages. Also, do not mega out these motors. If you've got a motor that's attached to this, you have to disconnect the motor from the solid state drive before you mega it out because guaranteed you are going to blow up the solid state drive if you try to mega a motor or if you try to mega lines that are going to be attached to those solid state drives. Make sure those things are isolated before you mega and you cannot mega check the drive itself. Troubleshooting these is usually going to be fairly easy. This one here shows you a picture of um, just indicator lights that could be on the front of them. They've got all sorts. A lot of them at this point with the cheapness of our LCD displays, liquid crystals, and you know OLEDs and everything else like that is getting so insanely cheap at this point that we usually have got a readout where we can actually read what the fault itself is. Some cases they are going to go and have 
uh, code, uh, flash coding. Flash coding just means that we go and count the flashes or we look at how rapidly those things are going to be flashing. They show that for this light over here, this light is a fault light. The only time that I would ever see that fault light is if I've got a thermal fault, then it's going to be a slow flash. So if something's got too hot. Phase failure is going to be a fast flash if I'm missing one of my incoming phases. And if it stays on, then that's an internal, that's a control circuit, you know, fault that under logic and protection that that would indicate. Same with for alarms, I can have alarms if I've got an overload that's happening, I'll get a slow flash on there. And if it goes on too long, that thing will shut down. Uh, and if I need cooling, yeah, because this thing is getting too hot and that's why it's gonna shut off, then I'm gonna have that thing on, you know, steady. Drive itself, uh, the drive, if it's off, no light. They show that up top there. If it's ready, it's gonna be on a slow flash. So if it's just sitting there, it's just gonna be just a slow flash. Once I'm starting it, it's going to be a fast flash anytime that it's ramping. And then once it's fully running, the light itself stays on. Uh, common for us to go and have flashes. The other flash coding that we sometimes have is we have got counted flash codes where it's going to be pulses and then off. So it might be, you know, five pulses and then it's going to be off for two seconds then one, two, three, four, five. And then it'll just list. It'll have a whole list of, you know, what happens if it's a one flash, two flash, three flash, four flash, etc. And then it, you just like read, you know, what it says and you count the pulses and then go back and read what the, that thing is. It's a way that we can use just a single light to indicate numerous different faults. Last thing that they cover inside of here is checking your SCRs with an ohm meter. Um, we don't commonly do this because the SCRs are gonna be put right into the very back of these. If we do have one of these that is suspected to be faulty, because we've got back-to-back -back SCRs inside of here, until we get an SCR, it should be acting as an open. So I should measure a high resistance in both directions. Isolate it from the line and the load, obviously. Stick your ohm meter across it. And as you do so, you should read high resistance in both directions. Um, if you want to go and take it a step further, so if I read low resistance in either direction, one of them is screwed. If I read high resistance, that's probably fine. Then I want to check the gates. What you can do is you can go and take a reading between the gate and the cathode on each one. You would have to know what it is for that individual one. Remember that cathode is usually going to be identified with a K and the gate is just going to be a small lead. That's how we know when we're looking at the gate itself. Once again, uh, you should read at that point continuity because if you have got your meter polarized properly, you'll have a positive on the red lead. So it should put it into conduction, but it should be high conduction. So it's going to be, you know, five, uh, I don't know, five. It could go up into the hundreds of ohms, but it doesn't generally go that high. Most of the ones SCR, the power SCRs that I've tested have been sitting around the hundred-ish range. All right, that is learning task number four. Let's take a look at how these things operate next.